Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Amid fresh confusion over what South Africa's actual plan is for addressing its electricity crisis, there is some modest progress on the market restructuring front. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss these developments. Hi Terence. Hi Shmuel. The unbundling of ESCOM's grid company took a step forward this week. Yes, the National Energy Regulator of South Africa had hearings into the three license applications for the National Transmission Company South Africa, which is being abbreviated these days to NTC. So this is the company that will be unbundled with the transmission assets and substations, so the power lines, 33,000 kilometers of power lines and 170 substations. And it will also be the system operator, it will have a trading license, so the trader, and it will also be the import exporter of, of electrons uh, from the region or into the region from South Africa. So it's a big development. We heard this week that this is sort of getting to the sort of final stages now of this uh, setting up this independent grid company. And the, the three licenses are key. And once those licenses are in place, they can, can then get the lender consent that they need. So Eskom, as we know, has got massive amounts of debt and the lenders to Eskom need to know how this is going to affect uh, whether the ability to repay that debt. And it seems what will happen is that there'll be this uh, NTC with a separate board, separate staffing, separate assets, and with an, but the actual debt uh, and its debt component of that will still reside with uh, the holding company, Eskom Holdings, and there'll be, it will be reflected in the form of an intercompany loan. So I think the licensing is the sort of the key next trigger so that they can go to lenders and get that consent. And then if they do get that, either end of April, early May, if the licenses come through, then they say by about the middle of this year, this new operating entity will be in place with its independent board, with its staffing, with its assets. And uh, it will then be able to have this independent view of, of the system. This is seen as an important development for the future of the currently failing electricity supply industry. Yes, I think it's a key development. You know, we need to separate this grid company and system operator out of Eskom uh, because the future of generation is going to be less and less tied to Eskom generation. We know that any new power stations that are being built, whether, whether they're in the form of uh, wind and solar, those are all coming from other independent power producers through uh, public procurement programs like the REAP, which has sort of hit some wobblies, or through the reforms that have come into the market, which allows for distributed generators to use the grid, but to sign bilateral or multilateral PPAs with off-takers. So that there's a lot of action in that space, and we're seeing a lot of registrations finally going through the nurse's system in that space. So we need a, a level playing field here, so in terms of access to the grid. Uh, and this is why it's so important to strip out the grid company uh, from Eskom, which is a vertically integrated monopoly. This is the trend. In fact, it's a trend for many, many years and many decades, but we finally sort of getting there ourselves, where you have this independent uh, system uh, and grid operator and the different generators uh, and distributors sort of feed into or feed into or feed off that grid company and they can make decisions in the best interest of the system, not in, not in the best financial interest necessary of, of the vertically integrated utility. So it's, a, it's an issue of levelling the playing field and also ensuring transparency of costs and of resources because money is in the tariff is being put in every time we pay for the, the lights or whatever we're using. To, to maintain and expand the grid. But because of what has happened at Eskom for so many years, there's been an underinvestment in uh, the transmission elements and the substation elements and the power lines and getting the, the new power lines up. We really have to play catch up here. And I doubt that would have happened if there had been an independent entity. But because it was all part of a, a monolithic group, uh, it was hard to have visibility that whether that few cents that we pay for every kilowatt hour that was supposed to pay for transmission expansion and maintenance has actually gone in that direction. So we will have much better visibility now of uh, this r the ring-fenced element with, uh, within under Eskom Holdings 
and whether those assets are being maintained and built as they meant to in terms of the transmission development plan, which gets published annually on a rolling basis by ESKIM. But this positive development comes against a backdrop of fresh confusion over what South Africa's plan is for tackling the power crisis. Yes, I think um, obviously we're in a very difficult spot with ongoing rotational power cuts and there's a lot of frustration. And the President on the 25th of July last year announced an energy action plan which has two legs, sort of uh, getting the coal fleet which is limping along, it's been badly maintained, there's been corruption, there's been crime, there's been sabotage around that, there's been a, a flight of skills, getting that sort of stabilised. But there's a second leg, and that's really about bringing in as much non eskim generation as possible. One, to actually create the headroom to stabilise those coal fleets, because we just don't have enough energy in the system to, to switch them off for the long enough period to actually fix them properly. So that we, that we're operating these coal plants when they're available, which is not always often. We're operating them at a very, very high energy utilisation factor, which is not good for the future of these plants, even though some of them are coming to the end of their life. We need them to have a reliable energy supply coming out of them, and we're not getting that reliable energy at all. So I think this is the plan that was announced. It was refined as load shedding was intensified over the last few months, and the roadmap was unveiled not so long ago. And then I think what's happened now is we've got an electricity minister whose mandate is to actually implement the energy action plan. Uh, but that energy electricity minister is also doing his own thought leadership, his own thinking, and is coming up with uh, solutions that are not in the energy action plan. And that is uh, very disruptive. And I think the two key elements that are not in the energy action plan really is, is anything about coal life extension, that's not in there, as well as just these massive amounts of potential exemption from pollution controls that are also not in uh, that plan, you know, uh, the, the partly why uh, some of these power stations can't run at their full nameplate is they, they can't meet the minimum emission standards, plants like Kendall. So it's caused this briefing following the tour uh, of the 15 power stations by the electricity minister has, has really caused some disruption. It's definitely imperiling our just energy transition partnership with, uh, with those developed countries that have signed up to the $8.5 billion uh, concessional finance because that's all premised on our existing plan to decommission in terms of the schedule, not accelerated decommissioning on the whole, just in terms of the schedule. Now, any life extension, well, then you can expect you can, uh, you know, that money, you can kiss that goodbye because you can't be extending the coal plant. plant. You're going to have more carbon in the atmosphere. And it's also very disruptive because there's planning for the, in this uh, economy, especially amongst the export element, for a more decarbonized electricity system. And the reason that's very important is that we are extremely carbon intensive. You know, on a, per, you know, on a uh, unit of output in the economy, we, we, want, we are the highest in the world. So we need to de-risk ourselves as carbon border adjustments are starting to be either spoken about and in the case of the European Union actually they are starting to move into the implementation stage. So for the future long uh, term competitiveness of these businesses, obviously we need electricity, we need transnet to work, but we need that, uh, that our exports are not going to be penalised as they leave our shores and enter these other markets. And that's, uh, we, we, there's a big risk of that uh, 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 sort of coming through. and. The big opportunity was to accelerate the, the introduction of wind and solar. With these messages, or these mixed messages now coming out of uh, the union buildings, which, uh, you know, over the last few years, the presidency has held the line in terms of what we've made, policy choices around decarbonisation, uh, commitments on climate change, uh, has held the line on Eskom restructuring, has held the line on the need for to move into this new renewables-led system, has held the line on what that's going to mean for like electric vehicles, has held the line what it's going to mean for uh, hydrogen economy. And now, out of the presidency, we're getting these mixed signals, which is very disappointing and actually extremely 
worrying uh, at this point. Uh, you know, where we actually had a plan, we had a vision for getting out of this. Yes, it's going to take long. Uh, yes, it's going to take probably more than the 24 months that they want. And yes, we do have an election <laughs> looming next year. But I think not holding this line now at, and contradicting so many policies, including, and I think crucially where it's going to count, the fiscal policy. And I think that's what's going to put paid to these very disruptive plans because fiscally, uh, it, it would require so much money and it's so much risky money to be ploughed into Eskom that I think that's where it's going, that's where the buck's going to stop, as it were. And I think that uh, hopefully sense will prevail when the electricity minister ultimately goes to cabinet. Hopefully, if there are adjustments to the energy action plan, these make sense, these can be financed, and these can be justified in terms of our in international commitments and our existing policy. At the moment, what we're getting is a message that doesn't do any of those three things. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletter.